Spanning more than a million square kilometers, the Northwest Territories is rich with natural resources and potential, but much of it remains untapped, according to its premier. He's trying to boost awareness and investment from Ottawa to get northern development on the upswing and aligned with the priorities of northerners. Bob McLeod is in his second term as premier of the Northwest Territories, and he joins us now for more. Nice to have you here in our studio. Good to be here. We should say the Toronto Global Forum is what brings you to town, and you are, I guess, fighting the good fight and making the good pitch for energy and the development thereof in your territory. What do you think we in the South need to know about the potential in the, in the North? Well, I think it's very important for uh, Southern Canada to understand uh, the realities of the North, that we live in a very large uh, expanse with very uh, difficult uh, environment and geography, but we have uh, tremendous resources, uh, both uh, on the mineral side and in oil and gas and tourism opportunities. And uh, we need to pay attention to our economy. Our economy has uh, been uh, in decline and uh, we are organizing ourselves so that uh, we can better promote the North and make more people aware of the opportunities. We can't just uh, leave it uh, or take our economy for granted. So all of our population, including Aboriginal governments, are are working together. You and say all of the population. What's the population? The uh, population about uh, 45,000 people. And how did you get here today, just out of curiosity? Well, I came in about roundabout way because I came through Ottawa and Toronto, but uh, normally I'd go through Edmonton direct to Toronto. Okay. And how long does that take? Oh, well, just airtime alone would be about five and a half hours. You're a long way away. That's right. <laughs> what concerns do you think residents in the Northwest Territories have that are not currently being addressed the way you'd like to see them addressed? Well, I think that uh, uh, there's a number of things. One is uh, it's difficult to get investment in, in, into the Northwest Territories because uh, it's an expensive place. Uh, we have a very uh, significant infrastructure deficit. And also, I think that uh, we as Northerners feel that Southern Canada doesn't understand uh, our situation. Uh, you know, you hear all the good things about the true North strong and free and so on, yet uh, we live in a very vast expanse. Uh, we have uh, uh, very little roads. Uh, we, ha we have to rely on ice, ice roads in the wintertime, or you can only fly in or fly out and uh, it's very difficult to get uh, resupplies uh, into into these small communities. With climate change, are these ice roads in any degree of difficulty right now? Oh, well, ice with climate change, uh, we, we see the effects of climate change every day. We have mm -hmm. had to change the way we build roads, we change the way we build buildings because we live on continuous and discontinuous permafrost. It's affecting our uh, water levels you know the water is starting to warm up and it's uh, you know it's affecting our fish it's affecting our wildlife uh, we had like millions of caribou were down in in the thousands like the Bathurst caribou herd was about 800,000 the last count there's less than 8,000 uh, we've we've uh, having trouble resupplying our communities because of changing ice conditions the uh, Beaufort Sea used to be open or uh, ice free five weeks a year, now it's ice free 20 weeks a year, so it's affecting uh, coastal erosion and, and so on. Could that be a good thing? Well, uh, for the most part. Uh, I'm we, saying we the ice say, free part, you know, the, be, being ice free 20 weeks a year. Does that well, have it, some could, it could be for, for navigation, yeah. but uh, on the. On the downside, like tuck to yuck tuck, we've had to keep moving it because the, the shoreline keeps disappearing. Hmm. In the best of all possible worlds, what kind of investment are you looking for for the Northwest Territories and from whom? Well, I mean, uh, on the private sector, on the, on the mining side, we've had uh, three projects that uh, have been approved through the regulatory process for over five years. I've been having a very difficult time getting capital, access to capital to move on to the next phase. We have a $16 billion pipeline that hasn't gone ahead for the same reason. The commodity prices are too low. But on the infrastructure deficit side, uh, we're working very well with uh, 
the government of Canada now to uh, to try to get more investment so that we can develop infrastructure so that it will allow us for more investment opportunities. I don't have to tell you. The, I mean, there's one thing you can't do anything about, and that is you're a long way away That's from right. where the centers of capital are. So given that you can't do anything about that, what do you think you can do something about to change things? Well, we think we can uh, develop infrastructure. Uh, we, we've certainly uh, moved in a big way into uh, uh, fiber optics so that uh, we can uh, uh, bring the market to us. Uh, we, we're seeing uh, with the opening of the longer opening of the Northwest Passage, we're starting to see uh, cruise ships coming north and uh, sort of another example of the market coming to our people. So and tourism is a possibility. Tourism is, uh, is, one, is our fastest growing sector right now, especially with the Aurora viewing where uh, we have uh, a significant amount of tourists from Asia that come to watch the Aurora, stay up all night to watch them, and then. Uh, what month does that happen in? Well, the, we have three seasons. We have the the fall season, then we got the winter season, and we have the spring. You have a winter season. The winter season, the best time to view the Aurora is uh, when it's really cold, uh, 45 below or colder. You get uh, tourists coming to NWT when it's 45 below. That's right, and they stay up all night to watch the Aurora. That is a hearty bunch. I want to read something that you wrote about a year ago. Here we go, Premier. The promise of the North is fading, you wrote, and the dreams of Northerners are dying as we see a reemergence of colonialism. For too long now, policies have been imposed on us from Ottawa and southern Canada that despite good intentions sometimes and ignorance other times, are threatening our economic potential and the decades-long work that we as a government have taken on Indigenous reconciliation. Whether it be ill-conceived ways of funding social programs or new and perplexing restrictions on our economic development, our spirit and our energy are being sapped. Why did you write that? Well, I was very concerned about uh, some decisions that were made, especially with the announcement of a moratorium, uh, indefinite uh, moratorium on, in the Beaufort Sea on oil and gas. And uh, uh, we had always, uh, in the Northwest Territories, we always saw ourselves as the, the last frontier where our tremendous resources uh, would be needed and would be developed. And uh, with one swoop of a pen, uh, everything disappeared. Whose uh, pen did that? Well, it was done by the government of, government of Canada. Which one? Uh, the current government. And uh, so uh, we felt it was very important to get the message out, uh, especially as it was done without an economic strategy. Does the moratorium persist? Well, we have uh, reached agreement now where we will uh, renegotiate, we, we will recommence negotiations on the co-management of the offshore in the Beaufort. And it is our expectation that we will deal with that. Uh, also, uh, we have developed uh, improve relationships with the government of Canada. It is better now. It's uh, significantly better. Uh, we have uh, uh, very good communications. Uh, we are working with them on developing an Arctic and Northern policy framework that will uh, lay out government uh, vision for the future of the Arctic over the next 30 years. So you know there is a, a ferocious debate in the country right now, particularly among some provinces and the federal government, over whether we should have a carbon tax in place. What's your position on it? Well, uh, we were against it at first. And uh, when we met with the prime minister in, in Vancouver, uh, we had some very serious concerns about uh, uh, that we felt it would just be a tax because it wouldn't uh, contribute to the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, it would contribute to food insecurity. And we felt our economy had never been fully uh, developed. And uh, uh, the government of Canada agreed uh, that the North was unique. They agreed to work with us. So we came up with a made in the North uh, carbon policy. And uh, we're very close to moving into implementation phase because we realized that uh, uh, car, uh, climate change is affecting us on a daily basis, and we want to do our part to uh, to contribute to the solution. So at the moment, you have no interest in joining the legal case led by Saskatchewan and Ontario against the federal carbon tax. No, we've been we've been 
through that, we've looked at the situation and we've come up with a with a workable solution for the Northwest Territories. Okay, let's uh, bring up, I'll ask our director Sheldon Osmond to bring up this next graphic here because we want to do uh, just a, um, a piece here on the indigenous people in the Northwest Territories who make up about half the residents in the NWT. The Northwest Territories also has an Official Languages Act which gives nine indigenous languages official status alongside, of course, English and French and you are the only jurisdiction in Canada to have done this. Since 1980, 10 of the 12 Northwest Territory Premiers have been Indigenous. So with that background in place, I wonder if you could tell us what you think your people and your territory has to uh, offer the rest of us in terms of improved relations with Indigenous people. Well, you know, with uh, over 50% of our population in Northwest Territories being Indigenous, we, we think that uh, uh, we have a tremendous opportunities to show the rest of Canada and the world how to work together in, in partnership with uh, Indigenous people. And even in our Legislative Assembly, uh, we have five out of seven cabinet members are Indigenous. So, we, you know, we say that's the best form of self-government around. We take the position of the three R's, we call it, respect, recognition, and responsibility when we deal with uh, Aboriginal governments. The largest business owners, operators in uh, the Northwest Territories are Aboriginal people. They, they operate uh, large uh, businesses like airlines, hotels, construction companies, and they're, they're our largest landholders as they settle land claims and uh, negotiate self-government agreements. So. Uh, we think we can show the rest of Canada how, how to work together. We think that uh, the programs and services that uh, they are able to access are, are, uh, are one, you know, shows how they can work together. What uh, are the biggest issues, you think, the, the biggest irritants between uh, Indigenous and non-Indigenous people in the NWT? Well, I think the biggest uh, issues is uh, how we deal with uh, the regulatory process and how we deal with development. And uh, I think that uh, we have some very uh, uh, societal issues that, uh, that we still have to deal with in terms of the healthcare statistics and uh, the education statistics are still lower than uh, the average. And, uh, but uh, we're seeing a uh, seeing it improve, certainly in the areas of post-secondary education, we've had significant amounts of uh, increases of uh, in, in, in participation and attendance. I bet you want a northern university, right? Well, that's for sure. I mean, uh, where would it go though? Why should it go? Why should it go in NWT as opposed to Nunavut or Yukon? Well, we think it's we're central. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is true. <laughs> we have you are central. And, you, you, uh, and Yukon on both sides, so. So yeah. yellow knife would be the good compromise position. Well, I mean, that would be subject to debate, but uh, I think that's something that uh, as long as in the, it's in the north, uh, we think that'll be the way to go. Okay. Um, Premier, humor me for this last question, okay? What's your name? My name is uh, Robert McLeod. What is the deputy premier of the Northwest Territories name? His <laughs> name Robert McLeod. You're both named Robert McLeod. Yeah, so I've changed my, my name to so I'm calling myself Bob McLeod, and I've let my deputy premier continue with Robert McLeod. Does this cause any confusion up there? Oh, for sure. I mean, <laughs> the, and especially in our mail, emails, and especially when we're traveling, we joke about it. If he gets to the uh, hotel first, he usually takes the better room. <laughs> or, or a lot of times we go to the airplane, and they said, oh, you've already checked in. and. So we have a lot of fun with it. Are you two rivals or of, of the same political ilk as you were? Because you don't have political parties there, right? The way we do down no, here. No, no, we've, we've been in cabinet together for three terms now, so. You get along okay? Yeah, we get along okay, plus we both can trace our ancestry to Scotland, go but going back to the 1850s or whatever. Hmm. Well, um, I don't know the other Bob McLeod, but it's nice to meet this Bob McLeod, and we're grateful you spared some time for us during your trip here in Southern Ontario. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. I'm pleased to be here.
The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.